Breathing. Take a look at the person beside you. How often are they breathing and how much do they inhale every time they breathe? Remember that song by the police? Every breath you take. Every breath that a human being takes, if you standardize this for a 70 kilogram male, uh, is about 500 milliliters per breath. This is called tidal volume. It comes in, it goes out, and it's called tidal volume because it's kind of like the tides. If we adjust this, for me, and I weigh 188 pounds, every breath I take on average is 600 milliliters of air, which is 20 ounces of air because one ounce is 30 milliliters. So 20 times 30 is 600. We're gonna stick to metric here because that's how this stuff is done. And how often do human beings breathe? About every 12 to 20 times a minute, which translates to about every three to five seconds. I have drawn here five second increments and this table width is one minute. So I breathe 600 ml. Five seconds later, another 600. Five seconds later. In one minute, I breathed 12 times every five seconds, 600 mils every time for a total of 7,200 milliliters. That's how much I breathe in one minute. How is this actually accomplished? Well, we have lungs and that's how we breathe. Here are the two lungs. Let's make an important distinction first. Here's the heart. The heart doesn't need any instructions to beat. It just beats. The brain can speed it up or slow it down, but the heart just beats all by itself your entire life. Like it starts to, I don't know, I think eight or 12 weeks as a fetus, the heart is forming and it starts to beat and it beats right until your very last breath. It beats all by itself. That's the important part about the heart. The lungs, by comparison, are kind of stupid. They need instructions to do inflating. That's probably terrible grammar. <laughs> I have taken the lungs from Francis, our mannequin, and put them inside Wyatt. So this is approximately where the lungs sit. How are they actually inflating? The diaphragm is a muscle. It sits approximately here. What is a diaphragm? It's basically like a divider. This is how it got its name, between the chest cavity and the abdominal cavity. The muscle called the diaphragm essentially flattens when you breathe. And when it flattens, the vertical diameter of the rib cage gets bigger. And that's going to expand the rib cage and air is going to rush into the lungs. So the diaphragm is essential for breathing. There are other muscles essential for breathing as well. The other muscle involved with breathing is called the intercostal. It's the muscle that is between the ribs. This literally means between the ribs. Inter means between, costal refers to ribs. When you go out for ribs night and you're like nah, 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 eating ribs, you're eating intercostal muscles. They are the muscles that are between the ribs and they fit kind of like this. So that is the intercostal muscle. It's more complicated than this. There are external intercostals and internal intercostals. The external intercostal muscles actually are aligned in a shape where if you were to put your hands in your pockets like this, this is the way that the muscle fibers are oriented as if your hands were in your pockets, they run this way. And it's a little bit complicated how they work, but when they contract, they actually expand the rib cage. And the external intercostals will make the ribs come outwards and sideways. So the diameter of the chest from side to side will increase and the diameter from front to back will increase due to the external intercostals. All that is what's involved with breathing. Who controls these muscles? They are controlled by the brainstem respiratory center, which is down here. You may be putting two and two together now that this is what controls breathing normally and this is where an overdose with fentanyl or morphine or any of these opioids happens. Let's just show this pathway a bit. So here's a pretend neuron in this area here. It's sitting up in the brain and it's gonna send its axon all the way down. Now, take note, a nerve cell can usually, it almost always contacts, in certain cases, a neuron directly contacts muscle. That's a very specific situation, which is how our muscles all contract. So this neuron is sending this axon. This is kind of exaggerated length. So here's the diaphragm sitting here. And this essentially 
plugs into this muscle and makes it contract. Likewise, it would make the intercostal muscles contract. It's the brainstem that's controlling the breathing. Now, let's say we screwed up this situation and we took an excess of morphine or we put some fentanyl here. And what happens? This brain cell that is in the brainstem respiratory center becomes slower in its rate of firing. It's a little more complicated than this. There are probably neurons upstream of this particular brain cell in the brainstem that actually influence this and slow its rate of firing. It doesn't matter. The moral of the story is fentanyl in overdose amounts, morphine in overdose amounts, heroin in overdose amounts, hydromorphone, dilaudid, same thing, in overdose amounts, all slow down these neurons. Now what's gonna happen when it slows down? I now breathe more slowly and each breath is more shallow. Why? Because the neurons that are telling the intercostals and the, and the diaphragm to contract are giving the messages more slowly and they're giving a less intense signal. The diaphragm is going to lower less and the intercostals are going to contract less, meaning the whole rib cage is just not doing as much. Now when you breathe, let's say it's only 240 mLs, that's eight ounces. And let's say it's happening instead of every five seconds, it's every 10 seconds. So this is again, this is one minute represented here. Compared to what was happening before, you're breathing less and you're breathing less often. If this occurs for long enough or these become spaced out even more and we get an even smaller cup, you simply die. You just stopped breathing. The lungs are stupid. They are told what to do and they do it. They're just not inflating as much. This is exactly why you die when you get an overdose of this or this. Let's do the math of this just to make this perfectly clear. There's a mathematical formula that expresses how much you're breathing in milliliters per minute. That says respiratory rate, how many times per minute, times the tidal volume, how much you're breathing in with every breath, and that is how much you're breathing in an entire minute, which is called minute ventilation, which is a capital V with a dot over top. What's the normal circumstance for me? Let's say I'm breathing 12 times a minute, which is every five seconds, and every breath is 600 milliliters, which is 20 ounces, which is like a large coffee, equals 7,200 milliliters per minute. That's how much I'm breathing. Overdose situation, now you're breathing less often, let's say half as much. Six times a minute, six times a minute, times now only 240 milliliters per breath. The tidal volume is way down now. In an overdose situation, you're breathing half as often, six times a minute, 240 milliliters per breath, the tidal volume is decreased, and the amount of air going into the lungs in a minute is 1,440 milliliters. So this is essentially, in mathematical terms, what's happening with a fentanyl overdose. The amount that is going into the lungs has gone down from 7,200 to 1,440. If it persists for long enough, as they would say in medicine, is not compatible with life and you simply die. That's what happens. What do you do about this problem when it's happening right now? Well, if you're lucky, you have a kit with you, which is called naloxone. This is the antidote for a fentanyl overdose. It could also be the antidote for a morphine overdose. As long as an opiate is in here, then this drug will reverse what happens. So let's take it out of here. Let's suppose that this person is like lying unconscious essentially, and I was in a situation like this about two weeks ago, exactly like this, where this person is absolutely not rousable because their breathing is so low now that they're, they're just not conscious anymore. Now you take this kit. There's a syringe in here. Here's naloxone. This is real naloxone. You would open this. You would take this cap off. You would stick it right into this vial you would draw up the naloxone that's in here into this syringe and careful now with this sharp needle. It doesn't matter if that person is wearing jeans, it goes straight into their thigh and you inject the naloxone into their thigh. Let's take a look at the naloxone molecule. 
This is a cat toy. It's flashing, and the reason I specifically bought this cat toy is it's gonna stop flashing in 20 seconds. Naloxone only lasts about 45 minutes. When it wears off, the fentanyl goes back on that opioid receptor, and you can actually just overdose again, which is precisely why when patients come into the emergency room in the hospital, they're given Narcan probably once, and then they're observed. And if their breathing level starts to drop again, because the fentanyl went back here, they're given Narcan again. And there have been situations where someone has been given Narcan, which means narcotic antagonist. It's the same thing as naloxone. They wake up, they're conscious, and they say, I'm leaving. And the doctors say to them, you can die because your fentanyl can go back onto this opioid receptor. And they say, screw you, I'm out of here. And that person has actually gone home and died. So the general rule here is if you've given Narcan to somebody and you're not getting any response, you can give it again about five minutes later. What's safer than using a needle of Narcan? They now have nasal spray, which you can put it up one nostril and just spray it. Five minutes later, if you're not getting a response, you can do the other one. In the meantime, somebody should have called 911. This table is in a state of disarray right now, which could represent the confusion that happens when someone actually has an overdose, or it can represent the kind of the confusion that exists around why is all this happening in society in the first place. I would just like to reduce this to drug addiction works at a cellular level. And if we're talking about all the opioids we've talked today, they bind to the opioid receptor. This is the core of the problem. If you want to avoid this, and I'm not trying to necessarily be facetious here, don't take this molecule of fentanyl and put it in a syringe and inject that into your arm. That sounds obviously very preachy, but at the level of how it happens, that is how it happened. You took this and you put it in here and it ended up on this opioid receptor. That's what's happening. Thanks for watching this. And if there is one video that I would want you to share, it's this one so that your friends and their friends of their friends get a sense of why these drugs are actually killing people. And the more you understand how the drugs bind to receptors and cause problems, the more take one step back you're going to be when you're in a situation where you might be injecting drugs. Future videos, we'll be talking about other drugs of abuse that bind not to this receptor, but to other receptors. And we'll get into more about how we actually treat addiction. Thanks again for joining.